When COVID-19 struck, our leaders followed the science. Every step of the way, at every level of government, across the political divide, they told us they were following the advice of the experts. So why is it after more than a decade of climate wars in Australia, we're still fighting over our energy future and the science behind it? The government is promising a gas-led recovery, but won't articulate a clear 2050 emissions target. So where does that leave us? Tonight, we bring together the technology, the money, and the politics. You've got the questions, now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Good evening and welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, sustainability technologist and entrepreneur, Sophia Hamblin-Wong. Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Resources, Joel Fitzgibbon. Queensland National Senator and former Resources Minister, Matt Canavan. Independent MP for Warringah, Zali Stegall. And the Director of Investi Investor Group on Climate Change, Zoe Witten. Remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. We know you're passionate about this topic, so please do keep it nice. Now for our first question tonight, it's from Kate Charlesworth in the studio. Leading health and medical organisations are very clear that to save lives, we need to urgently phase out fossil fuels and shift towards clean, healthy, safe, renewable energy. Why did the government listen to the experts on coronavirus but is ignoring the overwhelming science on climate change. Zali Stegall. Well, I, Kate, thank you for your question. Uh, I agree. I think uh, it doesn't make sense. We saw a very strong response from the government. It accepted the science. And I thought we saw something really interesting, which was a Prime Minister and State Premiers standing up with experts next to them, medical experts, to justify the restrictions and the steps taken. We absolutely need that on climate change. And I think we need that chief scientist. Uh, we need experts to be talking through the facts of climate change, of getting us to our net zero by before 2050 we can, but we need to put a line in the sand to achieve that. Um, this is not a question of religion or belief. Climate change is a question of fact and science, uh, and it's time we acted upon it. Put ideology aside uh, and put in place a kind of stimulus package out of this pandemic that will get us towards a safe and sustainable future. Uh, Matt Canavan, why is it so different? Well, they are very different problems. Uh, and Kate, thanks uh, for your question. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, coronavirus, the actions that uh, we took here and could take here uh, directly helped uh, solve the problem. Closing our borders, of course, uh, prime among those, uh, a direct action we could take to, to prevent uh, the disease coming further here. And, and, uh, and all the other measures as well in, in local communities I'm up here in Queensland, because the borders are still shut as well. Uh, uh, so so those, are, those are things that directly helped us fight this virus. In the case of climate change, of course, though, if, if all the world doesn't act, or at least the vast majority of it doesn't act, you don't get the outcome. You don't get uh, the environmental benefit. So my major criticism at the moment with the international agreements around uh, climate change is their non-adherence. Uh, sure, we are adhering uh, to our Kyoto targets, uh, but many other countries are not, even those that loudly uh, pr protest their, 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 their favouritism for these. So New Zealand and Canada aren't meeting any serious reductions uh, in carbon emissions. Uh, the US, you know, US has pulled out. Uh, China doesn't even have uh, serious commitments in place. So there's a no, real Matt problem Canavan, here Kate who asked those the question... actions aren't delivering the benefits that our, we did on, on coronavirus. Uh, Kate, who asked the question, is trying to get back in. You are a doctor. You're a public health physician, aren't you? Yes, that's right. There are tremendous health benefits from taking action on climate change locally. You know, we could coal, coal mines and coal combustion facilities, for instance, are associated with increased rates of stillbirth and miscarriages, increased rates of some cancers, heart disease, lung cancer and so on. We could take tremendous local action to improve, at, which would have immediate health benefits, and then as well as making a significant contribution to climate change, to reducing climate change, which is also having really harmful effects on our patients and on our community. So there's like a, it's like a win-win situation for health and for the environment. It's a no, in health terms, it's a no-brainer. And there's tremendous frustration among health professionals in this country that we're not taking up those opportunities and we're not listening to the science. Uh, Matt Canavan? Well, well uh, what Kate's put there is a, is, a, is, a, is a different proposition about the local impacts of uh, 
coal-fired power stations or, or coal mining, and, and they do have an environmental impact. Uh, I'm up here in Rockhampton, a coal mining district and, and region, uh, but there's been major advances in making sure that uh, things like nitrous oxide and sulphur oxide do not, are not emitted at dangerous levels from coal-fired power stations. It's also the case, like coronavirus, um, uh, there's always effects of what we do, and it's the same with renewable technologies as well. Whenever you, you build something, there's, there's an impact. It's about getting that impact balanced right uh, uh, so it doesn't cause undue harm but still uh, provides benefits to people. Can, in can, can I just, jobs, Senator Canavan, can I, can I just draw you back, though, to the original question, which was about the way this government responded to the science and took immediate action. And yet here we are, you're years into government, and still members of your government are debating the science of climate change and the need for action. Notwithstanding the point you made about what the rest of the world is doing, you must acknowledge that there's just not the same straightforward acceptance of the science on climate change. Well, well, well Hamish, I think I'd also like to just deal with the, the general issue here you raise about accepting the science. I mean, we've seen it starkly on the coronavirus. There are very, very different scientific views being put on this issue. Uh, so it's not quite right to say that we just accepted the science. Uh, um, because you've got Professor Yunodis in the United States saying well, the actions governments have taken are, are far too strict. Uh, the Swedish government have obviously taken a very different approach. Uh, these are very hard questions. Now, I, I would posit that we have made uh, as good decisions as anywhere else in the world. Uh, but but the, there is always going to be a level of difficulty when the questions get detailed. And that's the same thing with climate change science. If you read the latest IPCC report, the level of uncertainty around temperature increases from a doubling of carbon emissions has increased in the last 10 years, increased. There's no consensus on exactly what that figure will be. There's a, a vast degree of uncertainty here, hey, Mish, as I there is with lots of questions else? in this space. Sure, Zoe Winton's trying to get it. Um, I just want to add, we are always necessarily in a situation with science where we have a diversity of views. That's why science is useful. Mm. Um, right. And what we've done with coronavirus, I think more importantly, it's very important that we've taken advice from the experts. Kate, to your point. But more importantly, what we've been able to do is put aside partisanship. So the difficulty we've had on climate change, we're going to have scientific issues that we have to wrangle through. We're going to have questions of what the best way to deal with that issue actually is. But the challenge that we've really had on climate change in this country is partisanship. And one of the most incredible things about COVID, alongside taking advice from experts, has been our ability to put partisanship aside, to have a national cabinet, which is a fantastic decision-making body, which we're now going to enshrine permanently by the look of it, um, and to really use that decision-making body and that decision-making infrastructure to get the job done. And the results on COVID, we can't say that it's been a raging, raging success because so many people, we've still got the economic issue to deal with, so many people have been impacted. Um, but relative to the impacts that have been seen in other regions, we're doing a really great job. So that shows that we're able to put partisanship aside and really cut through on issues and get, get things done when we want to, right? And I think in addition to taking advice from experts, that's something we can take away from coronavirus that, uh, that we can really learn from, we can take into issues like transition and climate change. All right, our next question tonight is a video from Rhiannon Galea in Ascot Vale, Victoria. As a professional working in carbon markets, I know all too well that we need to be reducing our emissions by 8% year on year to keep within 1.5 degrees of global warming. The drastic societal response to the COVID-19 crisis will see emissions reduced somewhere between 4 and 7% for this year. Given that it has taken a literal pandemic to achieve what is not even the required emissions drop, is there hope that we will reach our targets? And if so, how? Joel Fitzgibbon. Uh, well, Hamish, on the current trajectories, there's very little hope that we will even meet the targets, the modest targets set by the current government. And if I can just add to the answers on Kate, uh, Zoe's spot on. Uh, the difference is politics. And for almost 20 years now, uh, people have put, put their own political interests ahead of the national interests. And, and they are people on the left, the Greens, for example, when they voted against the CPRS uh, in the Senate. And, of course, those on the right... Uh, if, including, if I can say most respectfully, uh, Matt, just alongside me, uh, who have made this the central issue in a number of uh, election campaigns. Now, it's very, very clear to all the experts uh, that Scott Morrison has very little hope of meeting his 26 to 28% target uh, by 2030, particularly, you know, 
excluding Kyoto carryover credits. Uh, but this is where we find ourselves, and until we, until we find some form of settlement, uh, it's going to continue to be difficult. We're going to continue to fail. And the reality is, sadly, uh, for those of us in the Labor Party, uh, those who've, who've waged war against decent energy policy, bringing certainty to investment, and decent uh, carbon policy have been somewhat victorious. It's, it's won the coalition a number of elections now, and we have to find ways now of dealing with that reality. So, so what should you, what target should Labor take to the next? Election? Well, you know, I, I caused some controversy last October. I know you did, Hamish, by saying, "Look, we're three years in opposition now. Uh, there's nothing we can do for three years. The Labor Party wants more meaningful action on climate change." Uh, so, what and does I that posed, look like? And I posed the question. Uh, why don't we put all the focus on Scott Morrison by simply saying, well, for the next three years, we're just backing your target. And then if, if, we, were able, if we were able to successfully get to 26 to 28% without causing any harm to the economy, then that would be a great platform from which to argue we can do better. But isn't that the exact kind of political game you've just described as hampering Australia's efforts? No, I think it's putting the focus back on Scott Morrison. I, I think that uh, they too often get away uh, with making big claims on their targets without demonstrating an ability to get there. Um, Sophia, so is, that, is that the kind of action that's needed government. or is that politics? I think this is our great opportunity to really uh, take this time that we've had to pause business as usual and just um, focus on our COVID recovery. Mm. This is our opportunity to get businesses to enshrine sustainability and climate change in their recovery efforts. I think that we can absolutely meet our targets if we decide to if we can all work together and um, rebuild our businesses and rebuild the structures beyond the politics, I think that we can absolutely do it. But and you're sitting on a panel with two politicians, mm. one of whom has said, uh, let's ditch our target to get to 45% reduction in emissions by 2030. The other politician says we should get out of the Paris Agreement. What do you think of that? I think it's incredibly short-sighted and I think that the, the cost of getting out of Paris, I mean, Matt, I was really disappointed to read your Australian article where you call for Australia to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Accord. I mean, as a Queenslander, I really feel strongly that we need to be meeting our targets in order to, um, in order to ensure that our future, do, that we don't have future um, catastrophic climate change, to make sure that we don't have warming above 1.5 degrees, then also this is an opportunity to build industries and to create jobs around sustainability and, and in, in merge so many different opportunities that we may have in this space. Hamish, can I add something here? Yes. So the way I think of Paris, Paris is a room in which our trading partners, our customers, our states, our investors, and our companies are presently in negotiating what we're going to do in the future, what the industrial transition is going to look like and where we need this to go. They're having conversations like, you need green steel? Oh, that's great. Maybe we can make green steel. Maybe we should chat about that. What are you doing with your targets? How are we going to work on this? Us saying, oh, we don't feel like being in Paris is just saying we don't want to be in the conversation. Right? Matt Canavan, you don't want to be in the conversation. You don't want to be in the room. Yeah, I do. Well, I <laughs> I do. I'm desperate to be in the conversation. Look, uh, well, well, uh, I'm sorry, um, but how Hamish... can you be in the conversation if you're saying that yep. Australia should effectively leave that very room just described? OK, sorry, sorry, I was referring to the conversation we're just having, but uh, it's a bit hard by video link. But, um, but uh, uh, I, we, are, we are not going to save the planet from, from here in Queensland. And I also heard before that our investors, our customers are all in this room. Well, as I've said before, China is not, doesn't have any... Uh, uh, commitments in this agreement. Does anyone think that a country we can't trust to uh, live up to a trade agreement signed a few years ago is going to seriously reduce their carbon emissions under a global agreement? That is absolute fairy tales. The United Sorry. States has pulled out of, so, of Paris. I remember. And, and so this agreement is not working. It is not working for us. It is not working for the world. But unfortunately, it is causing an obsession uh, among Australian policymakers to distort decision making down a completely fruitless path. And now we've ended up uh, with the result of the past framing 10 this years as a where our manufacturing sector, hang on, I, I didn't talk over this, our manufacturing sector has declined for the first time on record 
in the last 10 years. So all this talk of creating new industries and having new jobs, we've gone backwards. And I think it's about time we reframe our priorities here and get back to reindustrializing this nation. Hey, the Ms. answer can I, can I, to this... Can I, can I, can I, just, just, I think Zoe was trying to get in, so let's okay. hear from her. Um, the emphasis on our industrial growth is a really good emphasis. And that is what our pathway needs to be about. To think of this as something, to look at China and say they're not taking this seriously. I remember uh, being at negotiations almost 10 years ago and at that time, that was where the blockage was coming from. And then a number of years later, uh, at the same negotiations, hearing that the big press behind the scenes was China. And in the time that it had taken to go between those two negotiations, what had they done? They'd gone and built an industrial base. They'd done nothing. A renewables could, could, of course they support base. it. Uh, of, of course they supported it because there was nothing imposed on them under the Paris Agreement. That's why they support it. They rejected Copenhagen because the, the world at the time wanted inspectors to go into China and assess that they were actually meeting their carbon emission reduction. So they pulled out. So instead we rolled over to them in Paris and gave them a, an agreement which imposed no obligations on them. And of course they signed up to it. Of course they did. And now we're left with a... With, a, with an agreement which is transferring industrial wealth from the West and from Australia uh, to China, a country that's bullying and threatening us at the moment. I think that's just absolute rubbish to be, with due respect, Matt, because at the end of the day, I think what, if there's one thing we can agree is we want to see a positive future for manufacturing and industry in Australia. Now, the two elements for that to be achievable is going to be affordable energy, the cheapest energy available. That will be renewables. The other aspect is we need to actually improve our manufacturing industry. At the moment, we have some of the most expensive manufacturing, the most least efficient from an output production point of view because it's so outdated. So if the government is serious about a uh, manufacturing and industry-led stimulus, then it should be looking at really uh, upgrading and making sure our manufacturing is at cutting edge because the markets of the future will be green steel, green aluminium. It won't, there will not be place for dirty manufacturing. OK. Our next Have question you... tonight comes from Simon Monk, who's in the studio audience. According to AMAR, the operator of our energy grid, by 2025, the Australian grid will be able to handle up to 75% renewables. Since wind and solar are already the cheapest forms of energy, shouldn't Australia be busy building to fill this capacity? Joel Fitzgibbon. Uh, well, thanks for the question. Australia is busy uh, filling that capacity. We're now at more than uh, 21, maybe 23% uh, renewables, and that's a better achievement than people were expecting even five years ago. The growth has been... Uh, substantial. But, to be fair, we're a long way off that Absolutely. map that the yep. energy market operator has forged, which uh, Simon is referring to there. Yeah, and we all have we all have big aspirations to do better than that. Um, but EMEA has a role to play here because the grid's got to remain stable uh, as well, uh, and we will need dispatchable synchronous power in that system for a long time to come as those renewables continue to grow. So. Uh, I agree with you, and we've got to have an energy policy in place if we are to, to expect investment to come forward in the renewable sector. We know that's currently dropping off because we've now been seven years without a substantial energy policy, and therefore we've had seven years of investor uncertainty, and therefore a number of years of investment drought. And until we can find a settlement... This is the point I was making, Hamish. You know, we've had a number of elections where... The Labor Party has attempted to sell a more meaningful climate change policy to the electorate, and we've lost. We can keep losing and remain in opposition, and get, guess what? how much you get to do on climate change policy if you are perpetually in opposition? Zero. But worse, you give, you get, you give deniers like Matt the opportunity to stay in government and continue to fail on both energy policy and climate change policy. So are you saying you don't think Labor place? can win government in Australia with a more uh, aggressive well, approach to climate change? Well, we've change. had a few cracks at it, Hamish, and it hasn't turned out all that well for us uh, so far. And my appeal, appeal last October was one to Scott Morrison for some bipartisanship. OK, we'll back your target for the next three years. Let's see whether together we can at least get to your target and if we can get there, as I said, without without causing people any economic harm, then surely then we've got a stronger platform from which to sell a more meaningful policy. Simon is trying to get back in. So, so AMO's got their integrated systems plans. Mm. 
that, that, and they've spent years creating these scenarios, and they, they say that within five years, we can actually already get to 75% renewables. They're the experts. They've been doing it for years. Why not listen to them? And, and investors are free to put in substantial more investment into the renewable sector, which would be required to expand to 75%. Uh, why is that not happening? Because no one knows what the energy system is going to look like in 10 years, and they certainly don't know what the investment environment is going to look like uh, in the out years. And this is causing a problem not only in the renewable sector, but across the energy sector more generally. But, but the ISP is interesting. I mean, this is where it's been very interesting watching the government's response, for example, with the roadmap and the predictions, because AMO's ISP, which ironically was commissioned as a result of the Finkel review, so mm. this was very much under a coalition government, um, the ISP sets out three scenarios in terms of a business as usual. We don't do anything in particular when it comes to increasing for renewables, and that still gets us by 2040 to 74 percent renewables and only 1 percent gas. So, putting into context the current focus on gas. On a good outcome, let's look at really reducing our emissions, we get to a 94 percent of renewables. So, that's telling us, the experts are saying, these are the three trajectories, and the middle one is a, a pass in the middle. But clearly, these are the experts saying this is possible and this is what we need to focus so, on. So, Zoe, why then are investors not throwing all their money at this, if that's so clearly the pathway? Well, I think going to Joel's point, what you want is uh, policy here that's going to show you what a transition looks like and give you a transition pathway. One of the difficulties I ha would have to agree, disagree about the um, ambition level and the reason I would disagree is because investors know what the shape of the full transition is going to look like and when we set targets that are not matching the shape of that full transition, then we're constantly in a situation where we're waiting for the reset. We're always waiting for the reset. And we're saying, OK, I know that's got to correct back to the line it's got to be on. When is it going to happen? And I'm not sure I'm going to put money down until I've got my trajectory right. So we need to have that policy certainty in place. But I would also reinforce the point um, that they are throwing money at it, right? Um, we've had more money into renewables than we expected. But we're still so far off what that, that roadmap that was painted by the energy market operator would indicate. But the growth is incredible, right? It really is. And we've had uptake here that has been surprising, that has made us a region that people have come to to, do, to play renewables, to have it give a go, to see how they can do grid stabilisation and other technologies because we've got such great uptake here. So it's going very well and the growth trajectory is fantastic. But you do need that policy certainty in place and that ambitious policy in place to enable the capital that wants to flow to flow. Right. Okay. The next question is for Matt Canavan. It's a video from Mark Edwards in Chapel Hill, Queensland. No one's built a new coal fired power station in Australia for over 11 years because renewables firmed either with gas or pumped hydro, are cheaper and more flexible. The government's own technology roadmap doesn't include new coal power. You've even gone on radio to say, I don't care how new power is generated, whatever is going to deliver the Australian people the cheapest prices. So what possible justification do you have for demanding new coal-fired power stations? Before we go to Matt Canavan, Sophia, I'm going to put this to you. Is there a justification for building new coal-fired power stations at all in Australia? I don't believe so. I think that um, there's a global trend towards um, moving away from coal. I think that it's a, um, not an energy source that I can see being very relevant in 2050, which is what I guess we're here to talk about, our energy future. Uh, and so I, I don't see much value in that, but I do, um, I do care about um, a just transition for existing coal mining jobs, but um, no new coal, no new coal mm. powered stations. You grew up in far north Queensland. Yeah. You have people that you know and love that uh, enjoy the sort of employment of these sorts of jobs. Yeah. Do you understand the predicament that someone like Matt Canavan might be in where he's trying to sell a message to his voters, well, I'm going to make sure you've got a job, so I'm going to make sure that there's more investment in coal. Yeah, I absolutely do. I have a lot of friends. Um, I grew up in, in um, Curramine Beach. I went to high school in Innisfail State High School and my mum still lives up there and a lot of my friends from high school work in the coal industry and um, I sympathise and empathise with Matt. I think that we... 
we care about the people in our communities and their jobs and their livelihoods. Um, but I also equally care about um, the tourism industry and the Great Barrier Reef and the, um, the farming and the fishing and, yeah, all of my friends that work in those industries too. And, and they are um, the most vulnerable to climate change. And so, um, yeah, I, I really think that um, it's not... It's not an either or kind of thing. I think we can be um, creating new jobs um, in sustainability in Queensland, um, but not necessarily in the coal industry, but we can be using our um, those competencies in creating new jobs. Matt Canavan. Thanks, Hamish. Um, well, look, I, I support the coal industry, not, not out of sympathy, uh, uh, but because it delivers industry and productivity. Uh, the reason we should build coal-fired power stations in Australia is it's the cheapest form of power we have available. This week, this week, Germany opened a new coal-fired power station. Germany. Uh, we're told a whole lot of rubbish in this country about the world moving away from coal when uh, coal demand continues to set records year in, year out. It probably won't this year, of course, given the coronavirus, but, uh, uh, but there continues to be enormous numbers of new coal-fired power stations built in our region using our coal. The most recent coal-fired power station built um, that the original questioner referred to, the Cogan Creek power station, uh, it produces power at an average cost, an average cost of below $40 a megawatt hour, which is more than half uh, uh, lower than what we've seen power prices prevail at across eastern Australia. Uh, coal remains our uh, cheapest form of power to provide reliable power. Yes, renewable prices have come down a lot, but it still is intermittent. But, but, it still cannot provide power let, all the time. Let, and, let's be clear and, about uh, this, though, Senator, because you're, you're a pretty lonely voice in this government calling for this kind of thing. Uh, new coal-powered, uh, coal-fired power stations uh, not really mentioned in this technology roadmap. There is some mention of coal, yeah. though. Uh, I mean, what is your interest? Uh, your, your family's connections with the coal industry are well documented. You've talked about it even in your, and, your maiden and, speech. Yeah. I mean, yeah. is this... Yeah. Is this also about your own interests that you're that you're pushing here? Well, well, Hamish, people can ju judge me on that. It's absolutely not, as you say. I've <laughs> disclosed that in my maiden speech. I've disclosed other interests all the time. I've been upfront about that. Uh, and in terms of being a lone voice, well, as I say, it's not a lone voice around the world. Uh, the only, but in this the only government, which that... which has been elected to to lead Australia, uh, you know, yeah. you are not uh, among many in calling for this kind of thing. Where does your interest lie here? How much? Well, does... look, that's uh... not that's not true in North Queensland. That's not true in North Queensland, uh, Hamish. We went to the last election promising uh, uh, to look at a coal, new coal fired power station up here in North Queensland because we have this crazy idea. We're a bit crazy up here in North Queensland. We've got this crazy idea. But if we're exporting all of this energy to other countries overseas for them to create jobs and industry in their countries, maybe, just maybe, we should take keep some of it here uh, to create our own industry, our own development, our own manufacturing industry uh, here in Australia. So, so, it is so a where, maybe so a where, crazy where idea, is, but it's an idea your... that I went to the election on and I'll continue to sure. fight for. But where does your family's interests end and the community's interests begin here? Where's the line? Well, well, well hey, Hamish, hang on, hang on. I mean, it's, I'm hardly, I hardly started talking about the coal industry you know, yesterday. Uh, uh, it's been part, as you say, it was in my maiden speech. Uh, I, I have been elected on that platform to, to develop our country and keep our jobs here. I think the best way of doing that is making sure we do not deny ourselves the cheapest form of power and energy. Uh, and I'm going to commit and try and stick to that platform, obviously, that I was elected on. We've had a lot of discussion tonight about election outcomes and what have you. Maybe if we want to get certain, do we actually listen to the Australian people? Because the Australian people have rejected a carbon price at the last four elections. Uh, the, the Australian people have never voted for net zero Zala, emissions. You, you, no you're shaking your head. Yet we seem to try and get bullied into these positions that the Australian people didn't vote for. I think, look, what's, I think if we can get back to the question, which is actually, let's think about it. In our Australian jobs, in the Australian economy, there's 242,000 jobs um, in, in mining, uh, of which it's only about 60,000 that are in fossil fuel and coal mining. Um, so what we're talking about, there's actually 1.1 of employment in Queensland, about 1.9 nationally in Australia. So we're not talking about the overwhelming, you know, this is a part of our employment picture, it is not our overwhelming employment picture. So I agree with Sophia that we can't do one industry at the expense of all others. 
We've just had a report in the US for 2019, renewables has equaled coal in, in power generation. So the idea that the future is in new coal is a fairy tale. I mean, that that's, is a fairy tale. That's because Matt of Wolf gas. Telling himself. That's because I, of gas. <laughs> and can, can I, sure, can, can I just say, I'm a strong supporter of the coal mining industry and I remind the audience that the vast majority of our coal is exported. It does not go to domestic generation. In my region, there are 14,000 men and women directly employed in the coal mining industry and up to, depending on how you measure it, 75,000 people in the That's Hunter right. region depended, depended on coal mining. So let's not pretend there's no economic yeah. impact here. The question was, will we have any more coal-fired generators? I don't believe so. I'm a supporter of the coal mining industry but I'm also a supporter of Labor's commitment to zero net emissions. They are not mutually exclusive. Mm. We won't have a new coal-fired generator because the market will never build one. But There's no law against building one. There's no regulation against building one. But the market has moved on. We've now got 23% renewables. They can easily dispatch at a cheap price. You've got to keep a coal generator running all of the time. They just can't compete. And you need about 40, a 40-year 40 return on a coal, a coal generator. It just isn't going to happen. But, but, Can I but if both that? of your parties committed to a clear long-term target for emissions reduction in Australia, wouldn't it solve the problem that's been articulated here tonight about investment uh, and therefore provide the communities that you both say you care so much about with some certainty? Yeah, it would. And, and when the current coal generators come to the end of their financial and physical lives, they would not be replaced. But because we've only reached 23%, we will need baseload power in the system for a long time to come. And that's going to be coal until those coal generators run out of puff. And it needs to be gas in between to give that peaking, uh, that peaking generation we'll need to keep the grid stable and to support the renewable sector. We've it's a pretty simple equation and we should be able to reach bipartisanship on zero net emission. I mean, just about every resource company has committed to zero net emissions. Why can't Scott Morrison do the same? OK, we've got questions coming up on gas in a moment, but this question, it comes from Sunrise Beach in Queensland. Hi, my name is Tamika. As a young Aboriginal woman, I'm not only heartbroken to hear about the destruction that Rio Tinto has caused in the Pilbara in WA, but I'm concerned that this happens far too often without making the news. We need to listen to traditional owners and Aboriginal communities who want to protect their land and culture from dangerous mining and instead build sustainable and renewable solutions. As the COVID Coordination Commission is pushing ahead with their gas fired recovery agenda and corporations are wanting to frack the NT without proper consent from traditional owners, how can we be sure that we won't see this type of destruction happen again? Uh, so this question obviously relates to the destruction of these 46,000-year-old cave sites in the Pilbara and Western Australia. Rio Tinto uh, uh, destroyed them effectively uh, as part of a mining project. Zali Stegwell, how did you react to that news? Oh, I was devastated. I just found it, from a humanity point of view, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine for the traditional owners how just horrendous that must have felt. But just for us, for anyone with a sense of humanity, a sense of wonder at mankind, to really comprehend 46,000 years of continuous human um, habitation, that was one of the only inland sites. It just beggars belief how the people in the executive uh, board of Rio could come to a de decision that that was the right step to go. Mm -hmm. I, I just... I, I, it, I mean, I know that Rio has now come out with a statement saying that they're going to review this and despite the legality of the decision they took, that they will review it. And I know the Minister, Ken Wyatt, has uh, announced that he will do an accelerated review as well. And I think that's well and long overdue. Um, but it, it really... That question of greed and profit over something so fundamental as our humanity is, is quite frightening. Should there be punishment, Joel Fitzgibbon, because Rio points out that they had ministerial approval to do this? Well, it was distressingly disappointing uh, for many, including, I think, all of us in this room. Uh, and I reached out to the sector today to reassure myself that the, the apology seemed to be a genuine one and that the company genuinely recognised uh, big mistakes uh, had been made and that they'd made commitments to both the Commonwealth and the state governments to 
to do whatever is necessary to right their wrongs as best they can. But I haven't had the opportunity to study it closely enough to have a view about penalties, for example. But it is very, very disappointing. Uh, Matt Canavan, your government knew this was going to happen. Why didn't you stop it? Well, first of all, Hamish, I don't think we can be or should be judge, jury and executioner here on such a detailed issue. My, my limited, and I've only got limited understanding of it, uh, given it happened in Western Australia and, and only broke in the last few days, uh, my understanding is that the decision here was ticked off by a committee that included traditional owner representatives. Now, there seems to have been obviously some failure or disagreement then among those representatives subsequent to that meeting. It was approved under state government legislation. Uh, so it, to be exactly fair, in, sure in, in 2013, was... and there were subsequent significant discoveries after that in 2014, and under the law in Western Australia, there's no ability for the traditional owners to appeal. My question to you, though, was why did your government not stop it? It was informed this was about well, I, to happen. I, look, yeah, I mean, my, my understanding, I spoke briefly to the Indigenous Affairs Minister, my, my understanding is there was not really scope for us to do that. As I said, this... this Occurred under state legislation, but look. I, at the same time, I think let's 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 get it properly investigated to make sure uh, something like this doesn't happen again. Uh, if I could return to the original question too, which also dealt with consent in the Northern Territory, I, I think it's very important that we respect traditional owner groups in both directions. Though there is a unfortunate tendency I find some, in some places to say, well, traditional owners won't ever support a mine or a development. It's not true. Uh, uh, here in Queensland, the Adani mine was massively supported by the Wangan and Jangalingu peoples. Yes, there were some against it, but it was massively supported by the majority. Yet time and time again, it was distorted and viewed uh, through southern media that all the Aboriginal people are against it. The coal-fired power station I spoke earlier about at Collinsville is being pushed, supported and led by the Beerai people, who are the traditional owners of the Collinsville mine. And guess what? Would like to see jobs and development on their traditional country. So those saying they don't want a coal-fired power station uh, in Australia or North Queensland are also denying those traditional owner groups their rights to progress uh, their land and their development and create jobs in their own way. Do you think, in part, that's because simple things like life expectancy, health outcomes and educational outcomes are so much poorer for Indigenous Australians and they are therefore well, keen for those opportunities, uh, regardless uh, you, you, of the you, impact you'd, you'd have, it might have on their heritage? You'd have, look, you'd have to ask them. I, I don't know exactly, but I, I, if I could take a punt, I reckon it's they just want a job and a livelihood like the rest of us. I mean, why are we investing $3.5 billion in the Western Sydney airport line? Like, that's going to be massive carbon emissions, right? You're building an airport in Sydney. It's going to have a huge amount of carbon emissions, creating a whole new airport. Why do you want that in Sydney? Because, you know, you like to fly, you want to have a job, you want to have economic development. And so, I think probably the Aboriginal people of North Queensland are the same. So, so just before we move on, I want to be clear about this. To, to the question of why your government did nothing to stop this happening in the Pilbara, your answer is that your understanding is there was nothing you could do. I, I didn't think there was much we could do. As I say, I'm not the minister and I'm not across all the details. Sorry, Hamish. OK. The next question is a video from Kate Cooper in South Australia. I'm a resident of the beautiful Coonawarra wine region. In addition to the gas drilling already taking place here, almost 7,000 square kilometres of our prime agricultural land has been released by the SA government for petroleum exploration licenses. The existing gas exploration projects created just one locally sourced job, that of the security guard. The gas industry workforce is FIFO. How will a gas-fired recovery help re-employ the 600,000 tourism, arts and hospitality sector workers that lost their jobs in April? Zali Stegel. Well, that's a good question, Kate. And again, I don't think it will. Um, I think there's a bit of a disconnect between this conversation and the language used by the government that it's going to be a gas-fired recovery. It's inconsistent with AMO's ISP. It's inconsistent with what a lot of the experts are saying and advising on the government. But the government's taken a very narrow-minded view. It has hand-picked uh, its advisers that it wants to listen to. When you look at the King Review, it was a very hand-picked panel that it wanted advice from. It by it it bypassed listening to the Climate Change Authority when it came to that. We now have in the roadmap a ministerial review panel, which is, again, a hand-selected pick made. There's no transparency, no guidance. The NCCC, again, our 
COVID Coordination Commission was a hand-picked panel. So um, this idea that the gas, uh, a gas-fired-led recovery, I think, is a, is a very... Uh, it's a narrow view. It's not supported by the evidence. Uh, and I would say it's led at the moment by uh, a lack of transparency and accountability. To, to be fair, though, you started this program saying that we should be listening to experts like Alan Finkel. He was on this very program this time last week, saying that he felt it was important for Australians to understand that gas was going to be the transition fuel and that it wouldn't be needed for up to 30 years. Sure, and I certainly disagree with him on that. And I think... Uh, so what, you pick and choose when you listen to not, the experts? Not at all. I'm absolutely <laughs> behind it. But what we need to understand is he himself commissioned Amos I to come up with the ISP. Now, the ISP is completely... So what I would like to put to Dr Finkel is actually how do you reconcile that view that we have 20, 30 years where gas would be a major part with the ISP? So do you disagree with Amo and the experts in that sense? I'm certainly not the expert. So, so, that's so the very to... expert that you started this program yeah. saying we should be listening to, you're now disagreeing with? Well, I'm disagreeing in the sense on his when he was on the program in terms of saying there's 20, 30 years of a gas-led recovery. What we need... I think it's a question of... It's not about being uh, prescriptive on technology. I think, in fact, we need to be technology agnostic but let the market decide where does the private sector want the investment, where will they trust um, the investment and what energy uh, source is actually going to get that the biggest amount of backing. Yeah. The, the Prime Minister was saying um, on the release of the roadmap it really wants the private sector to come to the party. We know super funds are the biggest source of funding to put into investment. They are committed to a low emissions future. So it is inconsistent to then be focused on a gas-led recovery. So, Zoe Witten, is they gas are the high answer? Emissions. Is, is gas the answer to our transition and our way out of uh, this downturn? So I think the really interesting thing about this conversation about Finkel and what his advice is in the, and the technology roadmap um, and the ISP is that the technology roadmap itself, the principle of the technology roadmap is a merit order. So embedded there in the review process is each year we take a look at the technologies that we have access to and we decide which ones we invest in and which ones are needed and what we need to help get off the ground. There is a merit order process embedded in that process and that's really important because what we have to do as investors, we're not allowed to leave reality. Every time we make an investment, we have to take the long view and we have to really do the numbers, right? We have really have to kick them around the place. Um, and if the technology roadmap upholds that promise to have a really good merit order in it, then to the point about the market, we're not going to have to... We're going to make the decision about if gas is the right investment in specific places where we make those investments. And the technology roadmap really highlights it as firming not highlighting it as a huge domestic gas boom, right? But we can't walk away from those long-term investment cases and we also don't want to get ourselves... I just want to add, we don't want to get ourselves to a point where we've made a really big investment um, in gas, let's say, and then in 10 or 15 years' time, no-one wants to buy our treasuries, which we're starting to hear noise about every so, time So, we're you're talk talking to... about stranded assets. We throw all this money into gas... Uh, and then we can't afford to pay for it or keep it? Well, it's more than that. A, you throw a lot of money into gas and then do you have to prop it up, as you say, stranded asset, 5, 10, 20 years' time? And my job is to answer calls from investors when they're worried about this stuff and they want an answer. And I can tell you that a very large portion of the questions that I've... the calls I've been taking in the last 18 months have been about gas. So investors are very uncertain about it, very hesitant about it, and that's the gas that we already have in the ASX. That's not talking about a gas-driven uh, domestic expansion recovery-type scenario, right? So they're already anxious about it and they're already questioning it. Um, but they really have to focus on the long game for gas, and it does go beyond just... Uh, how we think about gas here and how we use it in our own system, it goes to do people want to invest in Australia as a counterparty. So then does it only stack up if there's a lot of public money put into it? Is that what you're saying? No, because no. even if you pay for it, let's say, you, let's say you just the money comes out of nowhere and you pay for it, fantastic, it's done, you're still having to deal with a bunch of trade parties who are your counterparties, who are looking at you as an energy-intensive uh, point of origin for their products. So... Um, Europe, for example, is thinking about implementing a border-adjusted carbon price. And what that does is when you're importing from a place that doesn't have its own carbon price, you put a tariff on it when it comes in the door.
That's a really popular policy mechanism that is getting discussed around the world increasingly, included occasionally in the United States. What you don't want to find yourself in, the position you don't want to end up in, is in 20 years' time to be trying to be exporting to Europe, trying to be exporting to Asia, and they're saying, oh, you're actually quite emissions intensive, we're going to put a tax on the door, right? And that's why you have to be very careful about investing in the right technologies now and being technology agnostic. Joel we have Fitzgibbon, well, Hamish, that's a dose of reality uh, for people like well, you. That is for the market to determine, Hamish. The, it, is, it's, it is just a fact that gas will need to be part of the equation. It's inconceivable that we could meet so, our so aspirations without investors pay for uh, the gas projects. And, but, you know, I'm from the Hunter Valley arguably the greatest wine region, because our question came from someone in the Goonawarra. I, I, I just they... need to pull you up, because you just said the answer is investors are paying for it. You've got someone here that's talking to them day in, day out. Are they going to? No, no. Zoe, well, are they going well, to pay well, for it? Well, of course it? they will. I, I deeply if, doubt. Of course they... I deeply well, I doubt they will I know some people encourage them uh, to have doubts about that, but of course they will, and they are doing so as we speak, Hamish. They are doing so as we speak. Now, can I big neurons that? and gas exploration and extraction can coexist. And, you know, Queensland farmers were, received $500 million from gas companies over the last 10 years for, allow, for allowing them to come onto their land, freely and voluntarily. Now, not everyone will want gas uh, near their land, and I say, well, if they don't want it, don't go there. But there are plenty of communities who do want the opportunity and the revenue that derives from allowing gas to take place uh, in their local area. Our manufacturing plants will not compete, either domestically or internationally, if we don't get more gas out of the ground. Domestic prices will go up if we do not get more gas out of the ground. And I get angry when I see state governments putting bans or moratoriums on gas in their own states and then importing it from other states. And allowing others to take the any environmental risk that the, might be this is completely uh, inconsistent. You've no. just indicated no. that you're committed to a net zero. Yeah. We cannot be increasing gas out of the ground if we are committed no, to. No, that is zero. just wrong, Sally. That is an but, absolute fact. Gas is as high in terms of emissions as coal. So if you are cons if you are definite, if you are absolutely committed to a net zero, you cannot be advo advocating for more gas. 90% of the coal generators no, in New South Wales... Sorry, Matt, no, and I'll, I'll cede to you. 90% 90, 90 of the coal generators in New South Wales are 30 years old or older, at least 30 years old. Do you really think, Dali, really, that we're going to have enough renewables in the system to replace that baseload power and battery storage? No. Absolutely. We will absolutely need a lot of gas in the system if no. we are to fuel our industries and our households and be internationally competitive and, of course, to keep stability uh, in that grid. And I suspect Matt's about to agree with me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, actually, I was going to disagree with both you and, and <laughs> Zoe, Joel, just, just, for some, just for a change. Um, look, I, I'd just like to go back to the original question about landowner rights and farmers' rights. I think we've got the balance wrong in this country. We don't give farmers enough rights. So I don't quite agree with Joel to say that Farmers in Queensland voluntarily allowed gas companies on their land. I've been to some of those uh, landowners uh, and I've sat with them uh, having cups of tea and uh, there was not a lot of voluntary, the voluntary uh, 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 participation in lots of the agreements. There was a lot of pressure and that's not right. And we're not getting the mix right because you can see in the US where the property owners own the gas and have full voluntary rights, uh, you've got plenty of gas production. Business happens, <laughs> transactions occur. Uh, and if we had more landowner rights here in this country, well, sure, some people might say, no, that's fine, it's your land, but others uh, might take the opportunity and uh, we'd have a more home harmonious okay. system. <laughs> On Zoe's point, Matt I don't know what market Zoe is looking at, though, because she's saying that investors aren't investing in gas right now. Well, we've had the biggest boom in gas in the world's history. In fact, the biggest boom in oil as well. Uh, on the back of the shale revolution in the United States. Where is all that money coming from, from, Zoe? I mean, investors are piling into gas. Now, they're not piling into our gas because there's a fundamental problem with our gas is that it's at the higher end of the cost curve. That is an issue. It's an issue of geology, though, not of climate politics. All right. Our next question is from Matthew Rowan, and it's on topic. Um, in May of 2019, there was a... A working paper published by the International Monetary Fund that highlighted that Australia was contributing um, through various forms of subsidy $29 billion US a year to prop up the fossil fuel 
um, extraction and production of energy. Uh, the Financial Review posted an article, uh, I think it was late last year, uh, highlighting that we were contributing about $2.8 billion Australian to subsidise renewable energies. My question is, you know, if this technological roadmap is meant to be about giving every horse an equal chance, should we, over the next decade, level the playing field in terms of financial subsidy and contribution? Sophia. Absolutely, we should be having a level playing field for all technologies. Um, I think I'm the only technologist on the panel and I, I work in um, as a carbon utilisation technologist. So we uh, transform CO2 into building materials in something called carbon capture and utilisation. Um, and I understand um, that many technologies need support and subsidies in order to do various things, to scale up, to bring their costs down, to get to new markets, to decarbonise. And so it makes sense that um, some of the fossil fuel industries might need subsidies, and it equally does make sense that um, renewable energy absolutely needs subsidies. So I agree with your point. Yes, we do need um, to level the playing field um, and ensure that not one technology has an advantage over another. Why would we throw money into more of this carbon capture technology when we're not certain that it's actually going to solve the problem that we're trying to, to fix? Uh, so, I guess you're right. Uh, carbon capture and storage, um, that's what you're talking about. It's, um, that's an underground injection um, of CO2. So that's underground storage, which is separate to what I do, but that is a technology solution for decarbonisation that's enjoyed more than $1 billion worth of funding to get to where it is today. And yes, it isn't technology ready right now to um, store CO2, um, but that's the point. Like these technologies take a lot of money to get to market. And so there will need to be more investment in CCS uh, in the future, but equally technologies like the one I'm working on, um, CCU and um, transforming carbon into valuable products, equally needs to have um, support and funding in order to get off the ground, in order um, for the public to know about us and in order to um, get to scale to actually make a decarbonisation difference. Maybe Matt Canavan, I, I just need to bring Matt in here. Do you, do you accept that, uh, in fact, there could be a rebalancing of priorities here? Well, I, I don't accept the, uh, the facts that were put in the question. Uh, uh, there's no subsidisation of Australia's fossil fuel industries and we have a, a body called the Productivity Commission that looks at the subsidies that governments give uh, to different industries and it doesn't agree with the figures that uh, were quoted there. Uh, uh, a lot of those figures, a lot of that $29 billion is made up of something called the fuel tax credit, which is a, uh, a credit given back on fuel taxes to not just the mining sector, but agriculture or any users of, of fuel that don't use our road system. You know, the idea being that uh, the, the petrol tax you pay at the pump is to help pay for our roads, but obviously the, 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 big, uh, the big trucks on our, in our mines are, are operating off-road and on roads that they've paid for. Uh, and the other, the other part, so, of, it, so, big so part of it is... In so you're disputing charge. that this assists the fossil fuel industry, these rebates that you're referring uh, to? Absolutely. As I say, and that's not... Well, I'm not disputing that, the productivity... Well, you just said that you disagree that with the facts well. presented, the IMF statistics, the point of the global subsidies that are offered to the fossil yeah. fuel industry, including Australia. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think... Uh, well, you know, sometimes people get it wrong. As I said, I think the Productivity Commission here locally knows a lot more about... Uh, the subsidies given to our different industries, and they've rejected that. The other aspect is uh, when, invest, when, when governments build ports. So, for example, the Rudd government built, built, put a billion dollars into the Hunter Valley rail coal network, which I'm sure Joel was happy with. That's included in these subsidies, even though the coal companies have to pay for access to that rail. They pay it all back. In fact, the government's making a very good amount of money on that rail investment that was made. So that's not a subsidy either. And and, and the, so these numbers are often put out, uh, obviously, for certain political purposes, but they don't bear uh, uh, concordance with the facts. Zoe? I actually wanted to um, kind of go to the question of what we need to be investing in, because to the point... Sophia raised a point, which is new technologies often cost quite a bit of money. And I think one of the things we probably haven't focused enough in this conversation on is the growth opportunities that we have. Um, we've got an incredible industrial base here. We've got incredible human capital, um, many of them represented by people who sit on this panel. 
Um, and we also have some incredible growth opportunities. And we have counterparties who uh, are asking for some of those uh, advanced materials, low carbon materials. Um, we've already exported a lot of our renewable energy tech to the world. And so I actually wanted to make the point that it's not just CCS. CCS is important, it's going to be needed, but it goes well beyond CCS. It goes to steel decarbonisation, it goes to industrial decarbonisation, it goes to clean materials. And we're really well positioned to do that. We've got incredibly cheap energy here we will particularly we've got incredible renewable resources um, and this can be a growth conversation if we lean into it we just have to lean into it okay our next question tonight comes from Tommy John Herbert in the audience yeah my question is for Matt Canavan um, Matt I'm a seafarer who's worked uh, in some of Australia's biggest resource projects uh, at the moment there's huge potential for renewable energy and especially offshore wind to support uh, strong consistent power for households and industry near the coast. At the moment, we're in a jobs crisis. And on top of that, we're in a climate crisis and workers like myself would love to work in these jobs uh, that contribute to our future. We've got companies at the moment that have uh, got plans in place to build these projects, uh, but time and time again, we're met with ideological resistance to renewable energy from this government. So my question is, when will the government start supporting the development of offshore wind and stop dragging its feet uh, on this new legislation we need to allow these projects to go ahead? Matt Canavan. Well, well um, just on the specific question with the legislation, uh, that's something I fully support and that will be developed. There is uh, uh, already a regime in place, though, to approve uh, offshore wind turbines, but there has been a desire to, to clean it up and make it the same in the same uh, governance as we do for offshore oil and gas platforms. So that's something the government will pursue. But that's not... I haven't seen any evidence that that particular administrative change is holding back uh, offshore wind investments. I'd love to see those investments go ahead. I want to see investments in all types of, uh, of energy. Uh, but I do think it's important that really what we've got to get back to focusing on is investing in energy, not just for the direct jobs in construction, but for what will flow on from that in terms of our own country's industry and capability. And too often we hear statistics quoted saying that this particular project will create 300 jobs. The problem is once the solar panels are up, all those jobs disappear and go. And that's happened in community after community in regional Queensland. Uh, whereas if we produce something that then has cheap energy at the end, it'll produce industry and jobs for decades to come. And that's what I think our country needs to focus on in particular after this uh, coronavirus jobs, jobs crisis. Clearly, Matt's never going to be changing his tune when it comes to talking about coal, and I think, Tommy. Um, can I say, when it comes to developing things like offshore wind, for example, a big key player that we have to talk about is actually ARENA and the CEFC. We've got a government... We, well, we know that ARENA is this running... This is clean energy, energy finance. Exactly. Uh, so, for developing new technologies, if we want to implement, for example, the, the technology technology roadmap and really implement where our future is and where the opportunities are, we actually need to give some funds. ARENA needs proper funding. It is currently going to run out of funding by the end of the year. So a big key test for the government will be in October, when the budget is announced, how much funding will ARENA have to develop the new technologies, the offshore wind and all those opportunities? Uh, Tommy? Yeah, just talking about investment, um, why, don't, why don't we use a government-owned Snowy Hydro to build these projects, to build offshore wind around the Australian coast. You know, everyone's talking about, um, you know, how we can try and solve this problem with the market, but we can solve this by investing in, in, in public ownership of, of the energy grid. And, and that would eliminate the... What we see today is the race to the bottom on, on work conditions and where you have workers... who The renewable in industry today as it is, is, is a bad place to work in with its conditions. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's another thing to have the jobs, but have jobs with good conditions as well. All right. Well, that is all we have time for on the program tonight. We're finishing the night with a musical performance, but thanks to our panel, Sophia Hamlin, Wong, Joel Fitzgibbon, Matt Canavan, Zali Stegel and Zoe Witten. And thank you for all of your questions. We're still enjoying seeing the videos. Uh, and thanks to those of you streaming us tonight on iView. Have a great evening. Please join us next week. We'll be discussing the terrible situation unfolding on the streets of the United States uh, and facing up to some of our own hard truths here at home as well.